in the most 2023 Division One transfers. And we have uh, two in this conference that are leading the way, uh, um, transfer a student athlete. So the transfer portal is still active. We'll take a look at that. Uh, several Albany State players hospitalized for fatigue-like symptoms. Of course, you know what we're going to talk about. It is dangerous. The weather, the heat, it is really uh, tough. So you got to be smart. And a lot of the teams are moving to night practices. Some of them are in, in a little bit. They have their scrimmage to kind of simulate game day uh, atmosphere. So it, it, it's going to be hot, folks. So um, our thoughts and prayers go to the players at Albany State hospitalized for flu-like symptoms. Charles Edmund of the Alcorn State Radio Network. Good morning to you, sir. Good morning, and to sentiment, those uh, echo those sentiments for sure. It is hot for sure. Um, just left our first scrimmage. Uh, we had a few clouds to kind of help dampen the heat, but uh, once some of those clouds dissipated within the last hour or so, it the, the, the heat pump got cranked up a bit. So just got back from watching our first scrimmage and uh, be careful out there because the forecast doesn't call for any rain. The forecast calls for triple digits for the next week or so with very little chances of rain. Um, so take it easy out there. Yeah, you, you know, it, it's just it's just crazy. In Baton Rouge yesterday, the heat index was north of 115. 100 and two degrees today, 103. The forecast tomorrow, 103. So the whole geographical area, please, please just uh, be careful. Now, uh, for Southern University, at fall camp, everybody's going through their fall camp. Most of the questions that you get for Southern University, how's the quarterback uh, position going? They're competing. Uh, Harold Blood, Charles is still. In control, Noah Bowden is really pushing him, and Donna Mahotro, they're all pushing. So great competition. And matter of fact, Bowden is really uh, pushing. So you, you like to see that. And after fall camp is over with and, and the coach is settled on the number one unit, I, I just think those, those backups, they can become starters quickly via injury. Number one players are not playing well, maybe. So it, it is important. Depth and quality um, for, for Southern University. So the pressure is on. They are really uh, competing. From the running back room, uh, Colby Dillon is back, getting a lot of reps with the number one. He's, he's famous for one of the single most rushing yards in Southern University history against Arkansas Pine Bluff. He went for two at 267. Knee injury, getting a lot of reps with the, the number ones, doing very well. But, you know, Kendrick Rhymes, Corey Russell, who transferred in from Grambling State. Uh, you also have Travian Benjamin, Gary Qualls Jr. I say all of that to say this because Ligon uh, is no longer on the team and, and Gerard Sims. We talked about it last uh, week. Um, they're minuses on the uh, roster. So, they they still got a lot of talent in the running back room. It's just a matter of just kind of competing, getting better every day. Um, people have been asking me about predictions. You're going to get predictions? Not just yet, but I will predict this. You just got to win the week, get better every day, go 1-0. and You can't look too far ahead. And for this Southern University football team, like others, it's just pressure to win. This climate now, you have to win, and you have to win now. So we always talk about it, Charles. Who can overcome adversity? If you don't have any adversity during the season, that's fine. But in most cases, you're going to have it. Injuries. You got to just get better every day. Yep. Football is, is a grimy, ugly, physical sport, and you are going to have players go down. And so, to your point, that's going to happen. It's not a matter of if, but when. And when that happens, you're one play away. Your number must be called, and you must come through. 
Um, you know, you talked about your quarterback situation down there at Southern. Uh, for the first time, we got a chance to to look at Tyler Macon, the Missouri transfer, looked really good. Um, mm-hmm. The offensively struggled early in the scrimmage, a uh, couple of picks early by our defense, which looks really good. I talked with our DC Cedric Thomas. He is just so elated with his defense, complete transformation from 12 months ago. Because remember, he he came on board late, but uh, the defense has got a lot of youth. It's got some experience and a lot of uh, mid-year transfers from the high school level, Carlos. Now, you talk about you know freshmen at the college level coming in uh-huh. from high school. We have a number of players that graduated from high school in December, came on campus in January, and they kind of got ahead of a, a lot of a lot of folks. So he's excited about that. Um, Jarvion Howard, one yard run uh, in the scrimmage today. So our defense got two early picks. Our offense got humming a little bit, and so I think that's going to be fine. I think we got to continue to work on special teams. Um, our offensive line's got a little bit of work to do, but this is just the first scrimmage. Um, you're going to have another one next week. And I think that's going to be the key because then the following scrimmage is going to kind of be a mop-up thing. Once you get into, to me, and this is just the way Fred McNair, I think, works this, once school starts, and that's going to be in another 10 days or so, then you're going to kind of round out the roster a little bit. And I think you can make that case for a lot of schools in our league. Once school starts, things kind of contract and you kind of know what you got. You know, right now everybody's playing, everybody's, you know, giving it their all because school has not started. But once you get into that, I think you're going to see, you know, you're, you're going to separate the wheat from the shaft in many cases. So this is the first scrimmage for a lot of schools. Um, I was listening to the radio New Orleans, Carlos. Southern's Fan Fest, I believe, is next week, 9 a.m., mm-hmm. 9 a.m. Um, August you know, you the 19th. A, yeah, night, yeah. yeah, 9 a.m. And, and try to beat the heat, obviously. They go to the mini dome and they'll be signing autographs. And that's smart because this heat is not going to let up anytime soon. And so you got to work through that. You know, you hate to hear that with Albany State, and I did read that. You just have to be careful. I mean, football is football. You got to work through it. It would be nice if we all had indoor practice facilities to kind of beat that, but we don't have that. So you got to kind of do the best you can with it. But uh, this is the first scrimmage for a lot of teams, and I think some questions will be asked. A few questions will be answered. A lot won't here through the first uh, couple of weeks of scrimmage. Yeah, and, you know, I, I – I have to, I learned a long time ago to temper your expectations because you're, you're playing against each other in, in a scrimmage, correct? You know each other. Um, and so it's not as great as it may seem, but then it's not as bad as it may seem. So you kind of put it in perspective. It, it, most teams going through that first scrimmage, but I, I just like to see the, in the improvement daily in practice and, and you want to make that improvement and so when uh school starts and then when you get into game week you know you you, you evaluate everything that's going going on but and, and then two teams get get tired of hitting against each other when the pads come on the first time uh in full pads they want to hit somebody else so i just learned to temper my ex expectations it's kind of like spring, the spring game. It's basic, it's vanilla. They're not going to show everything. And with these uh, first scrimmages, you just want to see who has improved, who has retained what they've been going through in practice, and now showcase it. You know, a lot of times they have officials there to kind of simulate game condition. So by the time you get to that second scrimmage, and then the week of, it will uh, tell tell a story. Uh, another big thing for Southern University: who's going to play re- replace Corin Harris and Glenn Brown? Corin Harris, of course, transferred in from McNeese, uh, all swag safety, and then Glenn Brown transferred to uh, University of Louisiana Lafayette. But you got Demetria Marcel. Division two All America from Boys State. He transferred last year with Carter, but you know, with transferring, wasn't really eligible to, to play. Now, this is a, a guy that you, you got to watch if you're, you know, Southern a Southern Knight or Southern Lums, because this this kid was an All American and he's moved right into the safety position. Glenn Brown's uh, position, uh, Tyler Judson is a safety who transferred in uh, last year 
a local product, Zachary High School, Tulane University. Um, they're, they're looking for big things. And then, of course, in the secondary, you got your returning corners, Rodney Johnson and Christian Davis, who we uh, interviewed on this show uh, in the secondary. Then defensive line, you who did you lose? Jason Dumars, Trey Lane, and Cameron Peterson. But now Taj Brown, and by the way, dropped 15 pounds. You go, Taj. Now can move around much better. Not that he couldn't move around before, but um, it has helped him in, in his game. Of course, Kelby Givens interviewed on this show a few weeks ago at defensive end. And then Davin Cotton circled that name two, two years ago, transferred in from LSU last year, knee injury, now is back and, and has been getting a lot of reps in uh, fall camp. So the defense line, and then uh, Rasheed Lyles, who we interviewed on this show, Louisiana Tech, moving outside certain packages. Coach Miller has moving him in on, on third down passing situations. Man, I'm, I'm trying to keep up, Charles. They, they, <laughs> they, they inside. Now they moved outside. Jelani Davis, who we interviewed on this show, moved to, to the outside. They have different packages. Then also a name to remember, Darius uh, Harry, defensive end from Southeastern that transferred in. Played a lot for Southeastern last year. Um, a, a pass rush specialist. So Coach Miller has a lot of things he can work on, and he, he's doing it. Coach Miller, of course, came over with Coach Dooley on uh, um, as a defensive court coordinator so you're kind of excited charles you you, you want to say yeah good morning to everyone in the chat room by the way appreciate you uh watching tuning in um less than a month now what three weeks three weeks in some cases yeah jack jackson state got a quarterback uh battle was looking at up. Uh, jason brown jacobian morgan zion mcdonald who um transferred in from i believe louisiana tech I always say UL, but they they've had uh, their fall campus story. There's they're scrimmaging. Um, I really believe Jason Brown will probably win it. Just my prediction at Jackson State. So you're seeing all of these battles. You said something interesting a couple of weeks ago with all of the teams breaking their quarterbacks. You felt you feel like that there'll be some lo lower scoring games, and then. How much impact using in this time in fall camp, the defense is what ahead of the offense. So it'll be interesting to see um, what what happens when you get into conference play. But I'm also intrigued and interested in seeing how well the teams in the conference do well in their out of conference games. Yeah, I mean, I think based on the number of teams breaking in new quarterbacks and we can go up and down the list. We've talked about it for the last several weeks. I think it's safe to say that defensively, if you're stout defensively, if you ended the season defensively strong, like all corn, like Southern, um, I think that's going to have to carry you a little bit until your offense gets going because let's, let's be honest. And You're Jackson right. State, Charles. Jackson State, too. Yeah. Been a very good defensively. Absolutely. Yeah, Jackson State was really good uh, defensively last year, but they've got a, they're have got they going to have no new quarterback, obviously. So defensively, if Jackson is as stout, as Southern is as stout as they were at the end of last year, and of course we were, and Cedric Thomas is really excited about his defense. He says he, he really has to do very little coaching. He lets his assistants kind of handle things. He just kind of sits on his perch. He, he looks as relaxed as I've ever seen him. This is second tour duty at Alcorn as defensive coordinator. He's got some young guys, you know, under him that can get it done. But I do think that until the continuity comes together at the quarterback position, which I do think is going to take time, I think everybody needs to relax because it's not going to be easy. We open up with USM. I, I really like, you know, I, I really want to commend Roman Banks, the AD, for scheduling Bama State in a game that doesn't, Count in the standings, but to play that game, of course, Jackson State, that was on the schedule, it's supposed to be in Birmingham, but it's going to be, you know, it's going to be played. You know, you have those games to kind of help you with the continuity against competition that you can compete with. It's going to be tough for us, obviously. USM, uh, Stephen F., McNeese. I think we can get McNeese if we can get it going early. 
So I do think defensively and special teams, if we can make some things happen till our offense gets going throughout our league, I think it'll be a lot more competitive. But I do think it's going to be some starts and stops from the offensive side of things. The one thing about Tyler Macon, Carlos, I'll just say this. I saw him for the first time in live action today. He gets the ball out quickly. He's a dual threat quarterback, but he does not hold on to the football. He he slings it. Aaron Allen's more of a pocket passer, the transfer from Louisiana Tech. We knew coming in that he has the big arm, but he's not uh, he's not quick afoot like Tyler Macon. So that's something that I saw today. We also have a freshman, Rod Hartsfield, that got some action today in the scrimmage. So there's going to be some quarterback battles, obviously, at Alcorn. Aaron Allen told me this morning, hey, I'm battling for the number one. I think he understands where he is in the pecking order right now. Um, he hurt his shoulder, as we all know, in the Grambling game, elected not to have surgery. Talked to him about that this morning. He chose to rehab it, and uh, he looked good in scrimmage today. So he's going to be battling for that number one. And that's and as you talked about, as we know, that's what you like to see on the offensive side of the ball. But I think defensively, we got all the pieces. We got the youth, a lot of experience from last year, the way we ended last year defensively. I think Cedric Thomas's defense is really going to be strong. And I do think throughout the course of the league, Texas Southern with their new defensive coordinator, new scheme, you know, coming over from Grambling, their DC. I think Texas Southern is going to be good defensively. We're going to be good, I think, defensively. Southern's going to be good. Jackson's going to be good. So I do think defensively, you're gonna you're gonna see some cre- some turnovers created, and I think you're gonna see some defenses really standing tall early on. Yeah, you not really. You don't hear a lot of things about uh, uh, Prairie View, and I, I was kind of looking at some some other um, sites with predictions and stuff, and uh, they a couple of them had Prairie View uh, coming in at number two in, in the West. So they're just quietly sitting there, and they don't get a lot of the conversation, but they're going to be ready. And I think everybody wants to compete. So uh, once we get through all these fall camps and talk about all the good things that are going on, then it's going to be game time. And we're going to find out quickly. Again, a lot of people look great. Then you put the pads on. Then you, you can tell another different type of story. You're going up against your teammates. You know each other. You know the little things that you can do, the strengths and the weaknesses. But then when you get in the live ammunition against opposing teams, we will see. We will see very quickly how things are going. But as we talked about it, most teams are breaking in new quarterbacks, except for Texas Southern and, and, and FAMU. But I, I think you have a lot of strong defensive teams in this conference. I, I, I Again, I just – one of the benchmarks I want to see, I want to see how well those teams that are playing out of conference – I'm not talking about NAIA schools, <laughs> Division two schools – I'll be a fam. You has a tough one. When you look at going against the other FCS teams, that's kind of a measure, measuring stick. I always talk about when Coach Richardson was at Southern University and they would play Northwestern State, who traditionally do, you didn't do well against those teams. Southern came out and won, what, four of the first five games in the series? It set the tone for the rest of the season, SWAC included, but it sets the tone. And, and that's where, as a conference, we, we, we've got to uh, get to. You know, Coach Dula at Prairie View, they did play, you know, a lot of FCS out-of-conference teams in, in out-of-conference. That's what I'm looking at. That's what I, I, I want to see. In the chat room, do you agree with me or disagree with me? It's fine if you disagree. I know some are just only interested in conference wins, playing other HBCUs out of conference in the Mid-Eastern Athletic Conference. Also, I want to see in the chat room, what do you think as far as record-wise, your individual teams? What is ex- ex- acceptable to you? Someone asked me, What happens if Southern 6 and 5 in the 2023? Look at my face. That would be bad. Technically, it's a winning season. Nope. They threw another scenario out at me. 
seven and four, but no visit to the SWAC championship. Nope. Not a good season for me as well. There you go, Johnny. I want to win regardless. <laughs> there you go. Well, yeah, and and look, you 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 brought up a, a, a good point in terms of what good what records could be, should be. And you talked about pressure. There is pressure for sure. You got TC Taylor taking the baton, Fred McNair. You know, and, and you and you kind of chided at me last week about this. You know, I, I you know, there's just different dynamics going on at all Corn State University right now. And the last two seasons have left a bad taste in a lot of folks' mouth, despite. Um, and so this is the year that we've got to get back on the horse. Got some quality home games, Grambling for homecoming, Southern coming in. Um, so we, you know, we the fans are looking for a lot better, as good as Southern was. Made it to the championship game. Left a bad taste leaving out of Jackson. I'm sure they're looking to get to Atlanta. You want to get to Atlanta. We want to get back to Atlanta. Um, I was talking to a Grandland Knight the other day. What do you think about Hugh Jackson? Look good at media day, but uh, we'll see what Grambling is going to look like with their defense with Cedric Thornton, former Brave DC over there at Grambling. Calvez is the quarterback. We'll see if you know Hugh Jackson, who's an offensive guru, can, can get that offense going. I think he's found his quarterback. But, you know, last year they just turned it over, made too many uh, mistakes, just self-inflicted mistakes offensively, especially in that Bayou Classic that hurt them. Um, I think the expectation is high for Texas Southern. Andrew Body, this is his third year. You don't see many three-year starters in the Southwestern Athletic Conference, the quarterback position. I can think of John Gibbs. I can think of, of Quill Glass. You can, you know, name a handful. But McKinney and Body are tied to the hip. Got a new president coming in. High expectations there. I pray you. They just can't finish the deal. They look good until the end. They lost to Alcorn last year in overtime. Lost to Valley. Cost them the champion, the Western Division. Coach, Coach McDowell says, we just got to finish the deal. They have been mm. able to do it. So it, it there. trust me, there's a lot of coaches that are a little bit of have some anxiety because they've got to get over that hump. And we'll see if if that happens. New coaches at Bethune, Valley, Arkansas Pine Bluff, they're coming. And uh, we go to Pine Bluff for homecoming. So, so many storylines, so many things to watch out for. And, yes, I, I, you know, I think fans like these type of schedules early. I think you playing USM in state is not the same USM team. We got to come ready to play. Playing Stephen F., an FCS opponent, I think a lot of people probably would not like to see that. But having McNeese at home coming, returning a game, I think people would like to see that. But this playing up, I think a lot of fans, a lot of our fans don't particularly care for it. They like, like you talked about, playing uh, the Morehouses of the world, the Tuskegee's, the Norfolk States. I think our fans would love that. Probably not going to happen, though. I, I don't see it, you know, in terms of travel and logistics, unless it's a classic situation. You know, Valley's playing in Chicago. Something like that, the Gateway Classic, things like that, uh, uh, Circle City. But other than that, I don't see too many of those SWAC MIAC games, unless it's the MIAC SWAC Challenge, of course. But I, I don't see it happening in any other, just like, just due to other factors. Um, looking in the chat room, Johnny says 2023, 9 and 2 West Champs and SWAC Champs. Southern let one get away and doesn't play well one week. Well, and, and it's interesting, you mentioned some of the fans, you can still play your traditional HBCUs, and, it, and just, just my opinion, but I, I I really look, and I get the antennas up when you play a Southeastern and a Nichols State. McNeese on Southern schedule next year, Nichols State. Not that I'm saying you have to judge yourself based on playing them, but beating them, yeah, you know, from the recruiting standpoint, bragging rights, and yeah, they've had success against the SWAC teams, and they brag about it. They do think they're superior. And so to me, when I don't feel that way, and I know I can do better, and I've seen it in the past, how they've competed against those type of teams, I'm ready to fight. I'm ready to play them, and I'm ready to kick tail. You know, so yeah, you still can do your traditional, you know, 
HBCUs, but you can also play those out of conference FCS football teams. I'm I'm one of those Carlos, you know, when I first got to Alcorn 30 years ago, we won two SWAC championships, two one double A uh playoff appearances, uh-huh. Northeast Louisiana and Youngstown State. And I was a fan of 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 the playoffs just in terms of may not we all know the financial disadvantage. The commissioners talked about that. There is no financial advantage for playing in the playoffs, but it's all about seeing how you compete, how you measure, how you stack up against the FCS. Mm-hmm. They have 63 scholarships, just like you have 63 scholarships. And we saw a little taste of it, Carlos, a couple of years ago when Florida AM went to the playoffs and they played Southeast Louisiana. You saw what happened there. And so those folks over there, when I say those folks, people who support the FCS, they're going to talk until we can start winning some of those games. You know, I would love to see us to continue to play the Southeasterns, like you said, the Nichols and the McNeese States of the world. I like to see Southern do it. I like to see more of our teams do it. It doesn't happen because we're financially tied to playing some of these money games and, and classics and other things. But where where you really want to see the competition, in my opinion, it's just me. I love the FCS battles. When we play a McNeese, when we play a Stephen F., those are the games I really like to see because they're kind of on your level. You know, they're kind of on your level. And Stephen F. Rowley didn't beat us last year. Jarvion Howard almost 300 yards rushing. And so I think clearly we could we could do it. It's just a matter of focusing in on it and saying, hey, this game means just as much as the SWAC. Because now you got people outside of the SWAC bubble saying, you know what? We can win these games outside of our league. But it's been a it's been a continued struggle. And you know, until we can, can win these games on a year out year in and year out basis, I think you know we're going to be at a disadvantage. Yeah, you're talking about consistency, and, and that's uh, what you want to do. I'm also going to take a look at the FCS teams bringing in the most 2023 Division One transfers. Uh, my JBN says they have the same number of scholarships authorized, but all the HBCUs funding all of those scholarships now from an individual standpoint i know southern is i can speak speak on uh, on southern All point is uh mississippi valley state now from what i've heard they they were supposed to be getting the full allotment of scholarship we're talking about football now right um and, and I, I would think the majority of our institutions our football programs um, they will get it done. Oh, Braxton Blackwell, Carlos, my man, what's good? The the, the long snapper specialist for <laughs> Southern University. Greetings. Keep grinding. Keep working. That is important. And by the way, he was a guest on this show uh, <laughs> last year a, a, as well. But Charles, FCS teams bringing in the most 2023. I mean, that's an easy one in the conference. They lead, they lead FCS. And by the way, FCS football, but Division One and everything else. Yeah. Uh, you want to thank who's number one? Jackson State. Correct. Yeah. Number two. Um. Uh, Southern. No. 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 no number two. FCS. Dun, 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 dun. Can we get a little music there? Oh my. Uh, they, they, I'll, I'll give you a clue. They play the first game in the East. There's always a battle. Whoever wins that game wins the East. Uh, oh, Florida A&M. Mm-hmm. Hmm, I didn't think Florida A&M was number two. Okay. Uh, oh man. Yeah. I, I, you know what? I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a take a break in a minute, and then I'm gonna pull it up. Okay. And, um, I'll give you the numbers. Uh, Alcorn. One, one thing about Alcorn, they. They go to transfer a portal, but not not much like other institutions. Grambling State and Southern are tied at eleven. Why mm-hmm. am I not amazed by that? Grambling always, always, whatever Southern does, Grambling's going to do. <laughs> I'm taking a little shot there. But both, <laughs> both have brought in in, in, in eleven players. With that being said. I'm um, going to get ready to take a uh, time out very shortly, but um, I, I want to tell you about a proud sponsor of the Carlos Brown show. And we appreciate them. Uh, the blue and gold century club. 
uh, supporter of the Carlos Brown Show. The Blue and Century, the Blue and Gold Century Club, will have its meeting on Wednesday, 7 p.m. in the Field House, the Tony Clayton Room. Refreshments will be served. Membership is open to any and everyone. They are proud supporters of Jaguar Athletics, the Blue and Gold. Uh, Center Club, they will have first-class bus trips to all of Southern University's away football games. Travel with the Blue and Gold Century Club uh, to Montgomery, Alabama on September the 2nd for only, for only $165, which includes a ticket and refreshments. And check this out. Parents of Southern University football players receives a special discount. For more information, call Craig Pierre. That's Craig Pierre at 225-324. Seven two three four. The Blue and Gold Century Club, a proud sponsor of the Coles Brown Show. And you know, a, a few years ago, Charles, when I traveled, the franchise traveled to the way games. I traveled with the Blue and Gold Century Club. I loved it. Yeah, I loved it. The friendly people. Then on the bus after a win, there's a lot to talk about. They didn't. They didn't let me rest. They talked. <laughs> to me. They talked to me, and I like to talk. After a loss, we still talk. There's a lot more to talk about after a loss than a win, right? L- L- yeah. And, um, <laughs> and, and, and so, uh, yeah, Johnny, nobody does it better. Johnny says traveling with them for over 20 years. And, I mean, it just, just the great uh, chemistry, the relationships you build, talking with people. And yeah. it's all so fun when you're coming back. <laughs> from Shreveport to out of state with a win. You yeah. just have that energy. You can talk to four, five in the morning. I'm going to tell you also when we come back from a, a timeout about Jericho Broadcasting Network. They've got uh, something going on that uh, we want everyone to be involved with. We'll talk about that next. So we're going to take a timeout when we come back. FCS teams bringing in the most 2023 Division One transfers. Uh, thoughts and prayers to uh, several uh, Albany State football players who were hospitalized for fatigue-like symptoms in, in this heat. Southern University, fall camp, scrimmage, continuing quarterback battles, battles across uh, the team. The pieces are in place, but as I said earlier, it gets to a point when you get through all of this, you want to hit somebody with a different jersey on. Gets another team. Live battles. We'll see how all of the quarterbacks will perform who will be leading their teams for the first time. You're watching the Coles Brown Show on the Black College Sports Network. We shall return. Itchy. Squirmy. Scratchy. Family not getting clean? Get Charmin Ultra Strong. Go get them. It just cleans better. With a diamond weave texture, your family can use less while still getting clean. Goodbye, itchy squirm. Hello, clean bottom. (laughs) We all go. Why not enjoy the go with Charmin? At Hampton Law, our primary goal is to provide non-traditional yet effective solutions and redefine the approach to client legal concerns. As your trusted legal advisor, we believe in sophisticated, personalized services that eliminate the confusion and complexity sometimes associated with legal matters. Our high standard for client care and concern, coupled with our extensive legal knowledge and skills, make Hampton Law a resource focused on the protection of the client's interest and overall goals. We value our clients and truly enjoy working with them. Visit thamptonlaw.com to conveniently schedule an appointment online. Tamika Hampton Esquire, 1631 Rock Springs Road, Suite 336, Apopka, Florida, 407-494-1471. thamptonlaw.com. No. Nope. Nope. Want him? Ooh, I like him. Quick, the quicker picker upper. Bounty picks up messes quicker, and each sheet is two times more absorbent, so you can use less. He's an eight. He's a nine. Bounty, the quicker picker upper. From novice to aficionado, find yourself here. High quality. 
cigars, plus personal customer service. Slow Burn is Waco's only mobile cigar lounge, featuring a meticulous curated collection of premium cigars. Visit our website, www.slowburnwaco.com. That's www.slowburnwaco.com. Stride K-12 Powered Schools are ready to put over 20 years of being a leader in online education to work for you. Dive into curriculum design for the online classroom. Team up with state certified teachers nice. trained in virtual instruction. Take control of your child's education journey. Discover the power of personalized learning with a leader experienced in preparing kids for a future they can be excited about. Take charge. Stride K-12. Enroll now for the fall. I tell you what, that's just a lovely scene. Scenery. You got to love HBCU athletics. Let me tell you about Jer Jericho Broadcasting Network. Um, they're trying to take everything to the next level of interaction and sponsorship with uh, their weekly shows and content. JBN members. Uh, they're going to have three different levels of membership available to support JBN and the Black College Sports Network. Beginning this month, we will offer members access to exclusive shows, first watch interviews, and discounts to Black College Sports Network merchandise. For over 25 years, JBN and the Black College Sports Network have been committed to the live coverage of HBCU events. Your membership gives you a chance to take the first step with us toward being part of the next 25 years of coverage. They want to thank you uh, for uh, your support. Let's see. We have the coach, Coach Petaway, in his beautiful maroon and white attire. <laughs> Alabama A&M, Charles Edmund, of course, of the Alcorn State Radio Network. And, of course, yours truly in the... Uh, I guess the traditional Columbia blue and gold. You know, growing up, we, we had something called sky blue. Kind of similar, but Columbia blue and gold. Uh, good morning, good afternoon to everybody in the uh, chat room. With that being said, Coach Petaway, good morning. How you doing, sir? I'm doing fine, Carlos and Charles. I'm, I'm happy to be here, man. We're happy to have you here. And, and you know, Coach Petaway, all, although you are the basketball uh, guru, you know all sports. You can talk all sports. And right, sometimes right. I have to remember that. Not just only basketball, <laughs> uh, but but football. But, Coach Petaway, I, I'm getting ready to pull up um, the FCS teams, uh, bringing in the most 2023 Division One transfers. That's from either FCS or and FBS. Um, I gave Charles a little quiz. He um, was 50-50. Jackson State, <laughs> number one. Fam, you was number two. Coach Petaway, Alabama and them. the previous year, they brought in a tremendous amount. But uh, it is the way of the world now, the transfer report. Right. I think everybody's using that now. And then, uh, like today, I, uh, we, we're having a scrimmage. The scrimmage is on campus. In fact, it should be going on as we speak now and I'm hoping uh, 
that that the kids, you know, they come out of that safely uh, in terms of no injuries and and then no heat related activities because it is kind of humid here in Huntsville. We do have an overcast. It is overcast, but you know we it, it's humid here too. So you know it's been in the nineties the last uh, several weeks, and and uh, so I, I know what they're doing. They're, they're getting it in early and they're going late to avoid some of that heat. So, but when it comes down to scrimmage, I know they have to do it during the the daytime hours because you end up playing during that time. Mm-hmm. So they got to get the kids acclimated to to it, and you just got to be you got to be smart. You got to be cautious and you got to make sure that you got uh, medical uh, people right there waiting for those kids. You know, you don't you don't react after it happens. You have them there on site so that uh, you can you can uh, help neutralize whatever's going on. Coach, yeah, because Coach you, Shadaway, I have never heard the word heat in Huntsville used in the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> because every time I come to Huntsville, I, no matter what time of year, I got to bring a skull cap. And especially in October, November, that's the first time, Carlos, I've heard Huntsville and Heat mentioned in the same sentence. I am shocked. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but, hey, but you know, uh, Charles, you got to think about this now. It was kind of humid in Elmore now for basketball. Oh, yeah. You, know, yeah, you, you turn the heat up in there. But but you're right. We're, we're normally known for the cold. and uh, But this time of the year, uh, the, the dog days of the summer and in August, yeah, they're going to get some heat and humidity. So. Yeah. Uh, they they got the, the coaching staff and our training staff. You know they got to be smart about it. Yeah, yeah. You said the key word, a uh, key word is being smart, right. uh, because we talked about uh, the Albany State uh, players. Um, you know, having to be hospitalized. And um, you but, know, but, but Carlos, huh? we had something worse than that to happen this week here in Alabama. One of the top, one, the number two ranked basketball player in our state. Yeah, young mm-hmm. kid from Pennsylvania Valley. Man, he died on the court. Yeah. yeah. Wow. He, he, he died while working out, play up, uh, pick up basketball. The kid died, man. He's one of the top kids in the state and one of the top in the nation. I think he's ranked like 20 something in the nation. Mm-hmm. So, uh, and, and the last name is Taylor. So, uh, you know, our hearts and, and, and our thoughts go out to he and his, I mean, to his family. Uh, but you just got to be, man, in this day and time, you never know. that. That's why on the spiritual side, man, that's why you got to be connected, man, because you never know how long we have on this earth. Uh, it, you know, anything can happen. You know, we had to scare a couple of weeks ago with, with Bronny James. So you never know when things are going to happen. That's why I think that you got to always be prepared, uh, even at a young age. You, yeah. You got to be ready, man. And that's, and that's kind of the most tragic part because uh, these are young athletes. Right. And, uh, and, and, and it's, it's very – uh, very, very tough. So, yeah, I'm sorry to hear that. And our thoughts and prayers uh, go out to uh, the young player and his family. FCS team bringing in the most 2023 Division One transfers. Um, this was an article by Sam Herder, dated August the 9th, 2023. Let's just get to the good parts. Uh, figures as of August the 9th, Jackson State, 29. Transfers in 17 FBS, 12 from FCS. Fam U coming in at number two, 28, only one behind. And Charles, you don't think it's pressure oh, on yeah. Willie Simmons? Yes, because they've got to defeat Jackson State. No excuses this time from some of the Fam U Rattlers. You know, Coach Sanders is gone, Shadur is gone. They've recruited well. They brought in almost as many transfers. If you don't get it done this year, no excuse. And then, of course, Northern Arizona, 28, Incarnate Word, Campbell, Robert Morris. But now, FCS teams that brought in 15 or more FBS, FCS transfers in 2022 and their 2021 versus 22 record. This is interesting. What is this? Alabama and them. <laughs> yep. Went from seven and three the previous year, brought in those transfers, went to a disappointing four and seven. Coach Petaway, Coach yep. Maynard, Coach Maynard's outspoken. He's a funny guy. He speaks his mind. Is there any pressure 
for him this year? Does he well, have to hit certain bits marks? Well, I, I think it's the pressure he puts on himself. You know, if you really know Coach Manning, he he's self motivated. Mm -hmm. He puts that pressure on himself. He wants to win. He's won everywhere he's been, and he wants to continue that here. And he was very disappointed that that group, that group of transfers, did not mesh to where they had a better season last year. But they've hit the ground running. He he expects uh, that quarterback battle to be settled pretty soon, and uh, he's looking forward to this season. He thinks that he's got a good group of kids, and uh, from from what I've been hearing, that everybody likes. The, the fact that the team seems to have jailed together. The players were here for the summer, and uh, everybody talks about the positive attitude that they see when they see the kids out. So I, I think uh, I think we might be in for something this year. Now, you know it's interesting, Charles and Coach Petaway? We often talk about it, particularly in basketball. You bring in players. Even if you don't bring in players, you have to have the uh, chemistry, right? right. And, and, and so – Sometimes you 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 bond and 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 I look at specifically here at at Southern University, some of the players. Gary Qualls came from Alabama a And M. He came in first thing. What he said, he said he fit right in because he played in the conference. That's one thing. But he mentioned um, the culture. He said well, he even mentioned the food. Uh, Coach Petaway, I guess he likes uh, Louisiana cuisine. But yep. you you got to get those kids to, to 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 buy in, and that is always a uh, important cog. Chemistry and how those players can bond together. Right. See, I, it, it's very important that your team bond. See, a lot of times you're going to have a great a good team if your kids can come together. Off of practice, away from practice. If if, if they do things together, Good they point. can't wait and just until practice and games to try to be together. They got to do that away. They got to build that chemistry amongst themselves, and that's why I think it's so important that the NC two A continue to allow these kids to come to summer school, let the universities pay for it, keep these kids together because that's the only that really that's the only time to bond. Because now when when classes start, man, yeah. that, that's a different animal. Because you got different schedules when it comes to classes. All your kids are not going to be in the same class. So the only time they're going to see each other is on the practice field. And it's hard to bond just at practice. Right. So it's got to be it's got to be done away, away from the practice field, away from competition. It can start in your weight room on their own. You know, being in the weight room, uh, coming to one cause, let's get better, let's get stronger, let's get faster. You can start in the weight room. But then they got to do things on that campus and away from that campus to get that chemistry that they're going to need when the tough times hit. Because when you hit a when you hit a wall in practice, you got to be able to count on each other to help bring you out of that. You don't always have to mm -hmm. need your coaches to do that. <clears throat> a championship team, they're going to have coaches within the student ranks. In other words, you're going to have players that are going to take accountability for that team and the responsibility of making sure that, hey, fellas, we need we drag it in practice. We need to pick it up. We we need we there are things that we got to accomplish during this practice session. So let's have a good practice. What they want to do is try to build consistency from practice to practice and week to week. They got to build up toward that first game. In some cases, some of them got two weeks, other people got three weeks. But but that chemistry, it should have started over the summer. It should have started back in the spring. When they had spring football, when when they were lifting, uh, in football it should have really started when your season ended. When your season ended for the returning players, they should have started that process. Then, as you recruit, when your new kids come on campus, you you incorporate them. Mm -hmm. But it's got to be more than just that coaching staff. The players have to buy in, and they have to get it done uh, amongst themselves, so that when they hit a rough patch. They can rely, uh, rely on each other. They can believe in each other. And that's what, as a coach, that's what you look for in, in knowing that you got a good team. Well, I, I can say this, Carlos and Coach, that, you know, I've, I'm around in the summer, and we had a number of players that were in summer school, and, and I eat in the campus cafeteria. And you talk about mm -hmm. the bonding and camaraderie. That's one of the best places to do it. And I'm there. Right. Most of the time when they're eating lunch and they're all sitting, they're all sitting together at one or two or three big tables, just joking, just they ain't talk about football. I mean, I ear hustle sometimes, but you know, they, they, 
you know, they talk about football, but they don't. It's just talking about the game of life or whatever it is yep. that's going on. And I think that is that is hugely important. And even in today's scrimmage, Carlos, when the defense was slagging a little bit, you had guys say, come on, pick it up. You know, you didn't hear the coach, the defensive coaches, Cedric Thomas or other guys talking about it. It was the leaders on that defensive side. And even on the offensive side, when we struggled to kind of say, come on, let's pick it up. So that mm-hmm. chemistry, that buy-in, all that <coughs> is important if, if you want to win at whatever level. And I think you're going to see that from some of these teams going forward. Yeah. And, you know, it, it, Jess, I, I'm kind of looking in the chat room and, um, you know, and, and I had to tell somebody at, at, at my full-time uh, gig this week when they were talking about, uh, you know, the weather and stuff, you know, particularly weather interests me. You know, maybe in my former life, I was a meteorologist <laughs> me or, too. A, or a forecaster, but those, those things are just interesting. And, and then you you get into the conversation, even some in the chat room was like, well, we did, we used to do three a days. We used to do, okay, I'm middle age. I don't remember it being, and, and Will and Coach Petal and Charles, you can mm-hmm. speak on this. I don't remember it being as hot as it is now. So you can be Mr. Tough Guy if you want to. Mother Nature has a way of putting you in check. And you got to be careful. It's not about who's the toughest. It's about who's the smartest. Yeah, you used to do three a days. Yeah, no water breaks. I understand that. But now, from an administrative perspective, um, Will and Coach Petaway, from a coaching perspective, a tragic thing happens. One of those student athletes passes away, you're looking at a damaging lawsuit. Correct. Right. I, I, me, and I agree. Put me in the room, that, Carl. Put me in the room. Uh, go ahead, uh, Will. Go ahead, Will. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah, you're, you're uh, in I'm the room. I'm sorry. I apologize. No uh, you know, Carlos, back when 2010, when I was at the North Carolina a and and I was the AD there, mm-hmm. uh, one of our track coaches had an unauthorized tryout. Uh-oh. And a uh, kid ran around the track one time and fell out and died. Wow. And, uh, you know, I mean, so, you know, I, I know firsthand, uh, you know, how those things can get away from you very, mm. very quickly. And, you know, how if you don't have coaches with integrity, if you don't have uh, adequate staff available, if you don't have, you know, trainers and, you know, a lot of that, so forth and so on. You know, if you don't have all those things in place, things can get away from you uh, uh, very quickly. And uh, so it's like you guys were saying, it's nothing to play with. I mean, there's no fans and buts about that. And, you know, having grown up in the 70s and, you know, played college football in the 70s, that sort of thing. And it was hot back then, you know, and we had three days, four days, and all that stuff. <laughs> we we walked we wow. walked ten miles. We walked ten miles to school one way and back, and uh, you know all the kind of stuff that go with that. But uh, you know, it's it's just nowadays. This is just a different animal all the way around, you know. And if you don't respect it, you know, then you know a disaster is just really just just waiting to happen. So, you know, you want to make sure I's and T's are dotted and crossed. You want to err on the side of caution at all times. And, uh, you know, you you got to have coaches with integrity, you know, coaches that are not – you you want the tough guy. You know, no mm-hmm. doubt about that. You're looking for the tough guy, that sort of thing. But there is a limit to that toughness, you know. And, you know, if, if you're not uh, wary of that, so you you're gonna be on the wrong end of, of something terrible, which is what you definitely do not want. Right, and, and see, uh, uh, another thing that we as coaches we have to take that responsibility too to make sure that we're doing things right. I have never practiced a kid who did not get a physical. I, I had our university make sure that they had a physical before I I ever put them through any workout. I've mm-hmm. tried never to do a workout unless I had a trainer available. And then for myself, I learned CPR. I did some of the things to help and protect myself. And I was just fortunate enough during my career that I never had a player to go down to where uh, during my practice that required hospitalization. 
Now, have I had kids get overheated? Yes, mm -hmm. but not to the point where they had to be hospitalized. <clears throat> and then the other thing is education. We have to educate our athletes. We talk to them. Well, I talk to them about how rigorous my practices are going to be. So now you got to prepare your body by, number one, eating the right things, hydrating, mm -hmm. and then making sure that you're not putting things in your body that are going to go against the training that you're going to receive. In other words, you need to stay away from the alcohol and drugs during the season because we're going to work hard. And I mm -hmm. don't want your body to be compromised through because of one of my workouts because of something you put in your body. So that's the understanding. But, you know, we have to be realistic. Everybody's not going to heed to that. Mm -hmm. So we have to be prepared on the other end to make sure that if something happens during that practice or during that game, we got professional help right there to help minimize whatever damage may happen to, the, to, to those athletes. And I think that's what, that's what has really changed. Number one, the student athletes have changed because they're, they're not – they don't take as much, they don't have as much uh, commitment as some of the, the athletes in the older times because they didn't have all those things to do. In other words, you only had your sport. If you played three sports, that's what you had to do. Now they got so many other options that they're not training like they mm -hmm. used to in the, in the olden days. And I think that's a big difference. That's why the athletes have changed. You got climate change. It's hotter now. Uh, the scientists are even telling you that, that, you know, because of climate change, things have changed in the, in the atmosphere. So it's hotter out there now. But we still have to be smart. We have to be diligent and make sure that we're not doing too much with those athletes. We're making sure that we're giving them proper water breaks. Back when I played in high school and, and college, we didn't get water breaks, man. What was that? That was unheard of. So, but, but, but now... Since it, since uh, 1983, when I started coaching, water breaks are built into practice. You can pick up one of my practice schedules, and it'll tell you when a water break is coming up. Those are the ones that I have scheduled. And then if I if I'm I'm smart enough to see that if my team is dragging, I might add in another water break mm -hmm. and give them a chance to recover because I wasn't there. I'm there to get them prepared to play. I'm not there. To, to, to try to injure anybody through my workouts and stuff, but they are going to be intense because I want you to be intense when you play the game. Mm -hmm. But we have to be smart. But well, understanding like this, guys, and I'm sorry to interrupt, you know, mm -hmm. un understanding this, you know, bottom line at the end of the day, you know, you, you, you're an athlete. You chose to play a particular sport, mm -hmm. okay? And me as a coach, if I'm not there to push you to the max, to make sure that you're working hard and maximizing your abilities, then I'm not doing what I need to do uh, from a coaching point of view. So, you know, as, as Coach Petaway said, it's about communication. You're letting these kids know I'm for up front. This is no picnic. This is how it's going to be when you walk in the door. This is what you need to do to prepare yourself for the agony that's ahead. You know, and that we're expecting you to come in here, you know, in a, in a certain uh, of physical condition to be ready for the rigors of what it is that we're trying to do. But make no mistake, we're here to push you to maximize your abilities, you know, and if we're not doing that as coaches, you know, then, then we're selling these kids short. Yep. You know, so my thing is, as long as you're putting that out there up front, and that they understand that, that their parents understand that, you know, when you when you walk through these doors in August, come August 1, you know, be ready because we're, we're going at it. You know, coaches are going to coach you hard. You know, this is still football, gentlemen. You know, this is still a, a, a big boy sport. So put your big boy drawers on and, <laughs> you know, let's, let's, get, let's get ready to get busy. You know, but like I said, if, if we're not, pushing our kids and helping them to maximize their abilities, you know, then, then in the end we're doing them a disservice in terms of not just that sport, but in their lives all mm -hmm. the way around. I, I would also like to add too, there's another piece to it in terms of protecting the university. I understand and I work with coaches, 
you know, a lot of these coaches that we have here do the CPR training and all of that to make sure they're as prepared as possible in case something happens. And I think, you know, athletics has to be prepared because we're in a different culture now. You know, you can sue a ham sandwich if you want to. Mm -hmm. And so when things happen, when someone passes away due to alleged whatever, that's out there because you're going to be examined in terms of your protocol, your practices, your water breaks when things happen. In the state, and I've mentioned it last week in the state of Mississippi, the high school association passed a rule that any outdoor activities must cease when the heat index exceeds 105 degrees. And mm -hmm. I just found out the other day from my, my bowling partner who works for a school here in Vicksburg, there's an app that the high school association uses, and it tells you what the heat, what the temperature is and the heat index, and you must document these things when you have outdoor activities, whether it's banned, whether it's cross-country, soccer, whatever. you got to document these things because if something happens, mm -hmm. then you have to backtrack that and prove that. So, those, you know, we're just in a different culture in that as well in terms mm -hmm. of when these things do happen, your finger's going to be pointed at someone, at mm -hmm. some situation, at some coach, some superintendent, some AD. And this is just, you know, this uh, unfortunate part from a uh, from an administrative standpoint, this is just the times that we're in now. So you have to protect mm -hmm. yourself at all costs. Mm -hmm. And Charles, just like you're not going to tell a coach what play to run, you yeah. know, I'm not going to tell the athletic trainer uh, when it's safe for us to be out there and when it's not safe for us to be out there. You know, we as athletic administrators have to rely on people whose expertise is in these areas. You know, so I expect my head athletic trainer or whomever the, 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 phys the physician in charge, you know, to keep me abreast of everything that's going on, you know, just like you wouldn't play a kid that's injured, you know, and look to damage him further. It's the same thing, you know, as we, as it pertains to the weather, things of that nature, you know, the athletic trainer has carte blanche in terms of deciding, you know, what direction we go in, how we go about it. And, you know, and no uncertain terms. You know, there's there's no conversation about that. You know, there, there's no debate or anything like that. You know, the trainer comes in and says, you know, coach so and so, we don't need to go out there right now because of this, that, and the other. You know, uh, uh, we're not having a debate about it with the coach saying, well, you know, let's give it five minutes and revisit it and all that. No, uh, -uh no, there, there's no, there's no conversation about it. You know, that word is law. And, and that's it, you know, and if you're a coach you and you want to lose your job very quickly, you know, then, you know, you don't abide by, you know, those those particular guidelines, that sort of thing. Let me do this. We need to take a break. And then um, I want to go in the chat room. Um, EA had a point that to, to Coach Petaway, I want to read that. Then we uh then we're gonna add um Dr. Cavill because we're gonna add another piece to this conversation and we'll move on from it and, and go to uh about Coach Petter, the point you made last week about you know the ever-changing landscape of college right. athletics. We see everything that's happening in the Pac 12 and, and now institutions are switching. And I think you brought up the point about how will that affect you know, HBCUs, specifically the MEAC and the Southwestern Athletic Conference. So we'll kind of look kind of to the future and um, we'll add Dr. Cavill to this uh, conversation. We've got to take a break. You're watching the Carlos Brown Show right here on the Black College Sports Network. We shall return. It's never too early to plant the seed, to share the tradition and instill a sense of pride in your HBCU with your little ones. HBCU Pride and Joy Children's Boutique helps you share your school spirit with a wide selection of adorable kids apparel and accessories officially licensed from your favorite HBCU. Visit HBCUPrideJoy.com and follow us on all social media at HBCU Pride Joy on Facebook and Twitter. This is Ryan Fulford. A.D. Drew and I are co-hosts of the BCSN Sports Wrap. We talk about all things related to HBCU athletics. From the games, teams, coaches, and fan interest stories, we cover it all. 
You can find our shows on Facebook at BCSN Sports Wrap, YouTube at MyJBN Online, and everywhere you listen to podcasts like Anchor, Spotify, Google, and Apple Podcasts. You can also find the show on the Jericho Broadcast Network's app. Make sure to download. We look forward to you joining the conversation and being a part of the show. I'm returning to Clinton, Paris, and Tampa's my community. I grew up here, went to school here, and my wife and I make our home here. What makes Tampa special are its people. So when I represent someone injured in my community, it's personal. Call my office and speak to a real lawyer and not some referral service. I will fight the insurance companies to get the settlement that you deserve. At the Law Office of Clinton Paris, we take the pain out of being hurt. Since 2002, Empowerment Resources, Inc., a nonprofit organization, has empowered more than 1,500 youth and adults in Duval and surrounding counties. Through its programs, Journey into Womanhood, Girls Mentoring, Life Skills for Teens, and Parenting Education Coaching. To get involved with programs, volunteer, or donate, visit www.empowermentresourcesinc.org. Follow us on social media, facebook.com forward slash empowerment.resources and instagram.com forward slash empowermentjax. Let's face it, shopping for insurance can be time consuming. That's why when it comes to your auto, home, and life insurance needs, make things simple and trust the experts at Allstate. They will help you get the coverage that fits your needs while helping you bundle your life, home, and auto policies. Bundling saves you money, sure, but it also saves you time, so you can enjoy the things that matter most even more. Contact me, Tammy Haynes, your local agent, for a free personalized insurance quote. Allstate, are you in good hands? From novice to aficionado, find yourself here. High-quality cigars plus personal customer service. Slow Burn is Waco's only mobile cigar lounge featuring a meticulous curated collection of premium cigars. Visit our website www.slowburnwaco.com That's www.slowburnwaco.com Welcome back to this week's edition of the Coles Brown Show right here on the Black College Sports Network. Charles, I, I heard a rumor that because you're a Grambling alum, you have 10 tickets to Grambling and LSU in football this season. Is that true? That is absolutely, positively, 1 million percent <laughs> not true. <laughs> 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 I wish I did, but I do not. That is factually incorrect, Dr. Cavill. That is not true. <laughs> oh, I had to pick at him. Uh, welcoming in Dr. Cavill inside the HBCU Sports Lab joins us. And uh, we're going to get his perspective on a, a couple of uh, topics. One being the MEAC and the SWAG. Looking in the future with the landscape of college athletics, ever changing, always changing. Will we see a different MIAC and SWAC? Will they become one? Charles, last week I saw your facial expression. You were like, no, it's it's not going to happen. But anyway, we're going to talk about that. I, but if I can, I want to go in the chat room and kind of wrap up what we were talking about in the last segment. Um, EA basically said he had a concern about, as I pull it up here, 
Here's a major issue with our HBCU medical staff that seriously concerns me. How many HBCU have uh, AEDs at every practice for football, soccer, volleyball? He says, I'm willing to bet a few because of your cardiac arrest, heart issues. Um, Willer, what do you think? I believe it's mandatory now, Carlos. Yep. And uh, I, I believe it's mandatory now, and uh, you know, to to have uh, ADs available, you know, in, in your facilities where you know you're practicing. Like I know, even at, at Fort Valley State when I was there, uh, we had one in the uh, in the gymnasium, you know, readily available. We had the the trainer uh, had one doing uh, you know football practices right there on the sideline, that sort of thing, and. Uh, uh, so we had uh, portable ones that we would take with us, you know, to the games, things of that nature. So, you know, we've we've spared no expense. And I think pretty much all the schools are in the same mode, mm -hmm. you know. So the, the coaches are trained, you know, as part of the CPR first aid training. They're, they're trained in terms of using the ADs, that sort of thing. And they have to be certified on them uh, every every year. You know, every summer as they get ready to come back to school, that sort of thing. So I, I, I think in the past, it was an issue. You know? Yeah. And, you know, there's probably still an issue, Carlos, in terms of our schools not having enough money to, you know, hire numerous athletic trainers, that sort of thing. And that's where you have to become creative. That's where your coaches have to put their heads together to make sure that we're not oversaturating uh, the support staff, you know, that we're scheduling practice times with, with those things in mind. You know, uh, you know, I've seen trainers come and go simply because they're being worked to death. And, uh, you know, and, and it's difficult to keep good trainers. Uh, so naturally, you know, you're going to pay, you know, out, out of the yin-yang for a good trainer and not just to pay for that trainer, but then you're going to pay to keep that trainer, you know, because somebody's always trying to get, you know, your better folk, that sort of thing. So, but I, I think times have changed now, Carlos, to the point where, you know, uh, uh, CPR training is mandatory for all coaches. AED, AED training is mandatory for all coaches. It's mandatory that you have two or three uh, AEDs on campus and, and all that sort of thing. And, you know, a lot of times we have utilized resources from other parts of campus because, you know, quite frankly, contrary to popular belief, they are students first and athletes second. You know, so, you know, having AED in the uh, gymnasium, you know, helps if something happens in a class or, you know, something like that. So it's just not something that's relegated to athletics you know it's a a universal wide uh type of issue right and carlos we i knew before i left alabama a and m i know we had aeds because one of our alumni donated two to our athletic department mm -hmm. one of them kept in elmore in fact it was in my suite until we realized well if i'm gone and it's locked up in my suite nobody could use it so we took it out of the basketball suite and and they put it in a central location so now I and I left in 2011, and I think we got these around uh, maybe 2005 or somewhere around there. So I think the schools understand the importance of having that type of emergency equipment around. And uh, just like uh, Mr. Willis said, some of them is campus wide. It's not just athletics now. So right. I think in that case, things have gotten better. And one of the things that we did at Alabama A&M, we as coaches, we put our heads together. And we pooled money to get a second athletic trainer when I was there. We had one along with the graduate assistants, but we knew that as our department was growing, we needed more help. So as coaches, everybody pulled a few dollars out of their budget to where we can come up with a good salary to add our second one. So there are creative ways of doing it. And then one of the things for an athletic director, go out and visit that local hospital. Go to the biggest uh administration of uh, medical administration in your city and, and come up with a deal with them let them provide you with help so you you got to be creative with it but you got to look out for those student athletes so it's mandatory you got to and as coach is saying as as coach is saying 
it's just not an athletic issue. You know, it's a right. university wide issue. You know, and when you involve the university administration in this, you know, if you have their backing and, and they're going out there with you, you know, to visit these medical centers and all that sort of thing, and, you know, you're coming up with, you know, some kind of consortium, you know, in terms of getting more help, you know, for your kids, that sort of thing, then it, it speaks volumes. It really says a lot, you know, uh, about your university, so forth and so on. Well, with that being said, um, EA, I guess hopefully that kind of the guys addressed your concerns uh, about that. Uh, Dr. Cavill, good afternoon. Welcome to the Coles Brown Show. Thank you. Thank you. I, before we get started, I just want to say thanks. I, I've made it officially. I'm on Carlos Brown show. <laughs> the voice of the people, the voice of the track, the voice of ACU, Charles Stedman. I'm with a legendary AD, Wheeler Brown, Hall of Fame, Coach <laughs> and Thetaway. It don't get much better than that. And as the gentleman was saying, um, yeah. And it was alluded on there in terms of Prairie mm -hmm. A&M having AEDs and a lot mm -hmm. of states are now mandatory. And that's from high school all the way up. Um, people are putting in, we just recently in our college of education where I'm associate dean on that side, we have AEDs literally on every floor of the building. Mm -hmm. And that's throughout campus. So it's not only that. And then you have at a lot of huge events, game days. Now uh, you mm -hmm. have a uh, ambulance there on site. Um, that is part of the situation that not only will help anything that happens on the court, uh, they'll do it in terms of folks in the stands where we've right. seen them provide medical attention. So the heightened to safety and what's taking place um, funding wise is not a big issue as it has been in the past. People understand uh, from administrators all the way from the chancellors, board of regents, presidents, ADs, vice presidents, all the way down to deans, provosts. They understand the importance of protecting students on campus. You know, and that's good. And it's an old saying, it's better to have those things in place and not need them right. than to need them and, and don't have them in place. Speaking of in place, Dr. Cavill, I actually come on and going to give your perspective, the possibility of the MEAC and the SWAC in the future as one conference navigating through the challenges of college athletics. I've learned in my middle age years that <coughs> things are always changing and sometimes you have to adapt. If you don't, you get left behind on some situations. But um, Coach Petaway brought that up last week when I was talking about college athletics and um, just it's always changing and we, we see things are moving. From a perspective, and I know years ago, you visit my home and um, you let me peek at a, a, a study you were working on about the possibility of the conference as a whole, you know, just kind of looking at the perspective of maybe how would it be moving up? But anyway, I'll stop there. But um, the perspective of uh, the MEAC and the Southwest Athletic Conference in this ever-changing college land, uh, athletics landscape. Uh, appreciate it. When Coach Federway brought that out, boy, I was excited. I say, oh, it's going to get hot in here. <laughs> it's going to get interesting. That's a topic that never gets old and dies. And I think it is important for us to engage into, into mm. the intellectual process of least thinking about, it. you know, what does that look like? And so I think a couple of questions come together first um, that can show us the benefits of what it might look like and certainly the challenges of what it would look like. And the first thing is, I think, in terms of challenges that I want to put on the table is the resources. And so essentially, mm -hmm. with Coach Petaway, the way that I heard what he was saying was this may be an opportunity to increase resources. Right. Uh, and so the question is, is where it does it take away those resources? And so one of the things that mm -hmm. I know a lot of people out there are that's one less bid going away from the tournament. We've seen that in baseball with the MEAC falling below the numbers and four of the teams that still play had to go to the NEC. So now they no longer get the bid, but it's even more important for basketball uh, because that $1.5 million, it continues to go up. Now one of the conference, conference 
So I certainly understand what you're talking about, but I just wanted to make sure others out there listening to us consider that. And a lot of the dialogue mm-hmm. that I really get excited when uh, literally Wheeler Brown, Van Petaway, Charles get in here, when you start talking about the business of sports, it is extremely important because you're educating our fans at a level that they hadn't had access to. And generally speaking, the more educated we are, the better informed and the better decisions all of us can make as a collective Mm -hmm. in terms of HBCU sports. So fascinating dialogue, and I'll leave it there for a minute. Right, and see, Dr. Mm -hmm. Bill, what I was saying, I wanted to just look at with with the way that the the FBS conferences are, are realigning, this would be the opportunity for us as the SWAC and the MEAC to look at to see if we could com- come together, come up with a super conference uh, of a North and a South or either East and the West, however you want to do it, but you still play regional. In other words, the MEAC schools will still play against each other on the regional and the Olympic sports. And then we would come together at the end of the year for uh, a basketball championship, a, a football championship, and at the same time, wouldn't we be able to come up with a television deal that will give us enough money that will make up for losing that one bid? That that that's what I was saying. Yeah, I, I, didn't, I, I know, you know, even when I was coaching, I attempted to put together a MEAC Squat Challenge in basketball preseason, and and you know, I I was bumping my head because I couldn't get I could not get enough people to understand that it was it was needed and that we should do it. So I'm just throwing that out there. I, I just I think it would work if, if the right people got together and looked at it. And, and like you said, I guess the most important piece of it would be the financial piece. But I was saying you don't have to put a strain on the SWAC or the MEAC by doing this interconference uh travel. You don't have to do that. Stay regional. That's what uh, I was looking at. Uh oh, I, 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 I think Willow wants to say something. <laughs> Mr. Conservative. You might, you, might, you, might, you might get Hampton, Hampton and some of the other schools that, that left the MEAC, they may come back. And then we can add in a Tennessee State. I think it would be a super conference. Go ahead, Will. I think, I, I think to, for me, the bottom line being the non-revenue sport. Right. You know, at, at the end of the day, you know, your, your track and field, your baseball, your softball, your volleyball, you know, uh, things of that nature, you know, it's, it, it would be very difficult for them to be a part of this from a, from a financial point of view. I think your revenue sports like football, basketball, those things you can kind of twist and turn and put in a bag and shake up and down and, you know, maybe come up with an acceptable uh, a formula for for getting those things done, you know. But the revenue sports, I mean, the non-revenue sports, which are just as much of a drain on an athletic budget, you know. You, you can only imagine if uh, Delaware State has to travel to Texas Southern, yeah, you know, or Arkansas Pine Bluff, or vice versa. Yeah, and uh, to play a single softball game or to play a doubleheader in softball, stay overnight and play two more the next night, that sort of thing. So I, I just think from a from a non-revenue sport point of view, somebody will have to come up with hell of a formula in terms of trying to get those things done. And I understand what Coach Petaway is saying in terms of doing it on a regional basis, that sort of thing. But at the end of the day, if I'm a part of a conference, you know, I want to play those guys. You know, I want to play those guys on 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 the regular. I don't want to wait until uh, conference tournament time to play Texas Southern if I'm Delaware State. You know, I don't want to wait until conference tournament time, you know, to play, you know, some of those other schools that geographically may be far away from me. Yeah, you know, so we would have to try to find a way to incorporate that to make that happen, uh, to make it financially feasible for for everybody, with the understanding that you know some of these budgets aren't going to change. 
you know, regardless of, you know, where you are in the school you're at, Valley's budget is going to be Valley's budget. You know, uh, 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 Jackson State's budget is going to be Jackson State's budget. You know, so unless there's a big infusion of cash on that flip side, you know, I don't know that you can realistically expect me at Mississippi Valley to, you know, travel to Delaware State to to play or travel to Howard or Morgan, you know, that, that sort of thing to play. And uh, on a regular basis anyway, you know, and I already have the third worst budget in all of NCAA Division One. So, I mean, it's going to take a, a, a hell of a vision in order to make it happen. Not to say that it cannot happen. That's not what I'm saying, you know, but stronger heads than mine are going to have to get at the table uh, to come up with the formula that's going to be suitable for everybody and to make sure that financially it, it works for everybody. Well, I, I have a point to make. How much of this, as far as the MEAC is concerned, all right? So we know the MEAC has lost a number of members, and the MEAC is a shell of his former self. We all know the financial piece of it. Dr. Reveal can break it down and talk about that. But then you also have another component of the loyalists. You read on social media, there are a lot of MEAC folks, young and old, or maybe more so old, older, that want to see the MEAC stay intact. And I just saw a post that said, we don't need a super conference. We need a larger MEAC. That's kind of where I was thinking in terms of instead of one super conference. And I get the financials of it. I mean, the dynamics are changing. There's no doubt. But how, how much of the pushback would be from the MEAC side to where we've been a conference since 1898? I don't know the year, but how much of the loyalists would win out over the financialist in this in this case? Because I think if that happened, I think there would be some pushback from the MEAC side of it. And as much as I would like to see it, I think, as Wheeler Brown pointed out, the financials would be tough to, tough to work. But then how much of the loyalists want to keep tradition where it is, keep the MEAC where it is, keep it intact as best as you can and add teams to the MEAC? So how much of that will play into the whole conversation? I think that's probably the biggest issue is, those that are dedicated to the past and some people literally have jobs on the line because now you're going to one commissioner so you're exiting a commissioner what does that do to the swag challenge swag me act challenge uh celebration bowl is another question in regards and the funds that go with it i, I don't get caught up into the travel as much i think that's something that is that is over Stated, I understand it because even in SWAC now, it's spread from Texas to Florida, and they do creative ways where they, in all non-revenue sports, uh, they play in divisions. Now, Weedle Brown has a point. If you're an athlete and you have some coaches that continue to try to negotiate and say they want to change the format of the scheduling because they want to see more crossover, uh, but ADs that understand the financials don't do it. So basically you would have pods. Uh, that would make sure that the mm -hmm. uh, traveling issue wouldn't be something that is an uh, uh, issue. You even see that in basketball. Um, you have it now where the Texas schools will not travel to Florida, Alabama in the same year. So it reduces mm -hmm. the travel and vice versa. The Alabama states and Floridas will not travel uh, to, Al to Texas or uh, Pine Bluff and Valley in the same year. So you take out the multiple travels and planes, you only have one trip. One of them's coming to you and you go to them and that flips to the next year. So um, that's just an example of the reduction of travel that you see. And that's, um, and you have the roundups, you see them do the roundups in volleyball. Now it's recently gone away, but there's ways that you can get into that point. But I think the bigger issue is what Charles Edmund just talked about. Uh, those that have a history since 1970, 50 plus years, they would not give up the history. And it sounds like y'all have already decided that this new super conference is going to keep the name of SWAC. <laughs> That's what I was going to get out there. You know, what is the name of this conference? And you're going to have a major problem if you don't include the history in regards to the name of the SWAC. So is this new super conference going to be SWAC <laughs> you know, You know, how does that work? Uh, so it can get even worse if you just uh, automatically – uh, so associated that the SWAC is taking over because that's what a lot of folks are going to think about 
particularly with the MEAC saying right now, we own y'all in the celebration boat. So yeah. that's a whole different conversation. And, and the swag MEAC challenge. Yeah. Well, it's a little, it's a little it's over a the little years. Better. This is in Atlanta. It's about two and two. So I kind of look at that a little different in regards to that. If you even go back to the cancellation, it's been three and three. So that's been different over the last couple of years in terms of the measure and the regular seasons. You basically have uh, close matchups. It's just been the celebration mode that has overwhelmingly been in the favor of the NBA. And, and guys, I thought about this the other day, just in preparing for this conversation. What if the shoe were on the other foot? Let's say the MEAC stays whole, and let's say some members of the SWAC leave, and we're a shell of our former selves like the MEAC is now. How will we feel as supporters, graduates of SWAC schools, how will we feel about our league and joining and merging with the MEAC? Would we, or will we turn into traditionalists and saying, hey, the MEAC has been around, the SWAC has been around for however long it's been around. We don't want to do this. We want to keep our traditions. And so I, I just thought about it for me. I want to keep the SWAC, the SWAC. I'm a product of a SWAC school, graduated from one, work for one. I don't know how other folks in the SWAC would feel if, I mean, this is hypothetical, of course, but if the shoe were on the other foot and we were impacted by this, how would we feel about, and if it proposed to us from the East Coast, hey, y'all need to come and join the MEAC and we can be this one super conference. How would we feel? They, they were trying to do it at one time, pre-Charles Commissioner, it was a little closer than hypothetical mm -hmm. than you want to speak to. There yeah. were some serious thoughts with uh, teams looking at it. Certainly, I know other conferences were uh, seeking different SWAC schools to join them. And fortunately, mm -hmm. um, it did not happen. And now the SWAC, in terms of the financials, is in a very strong place. But the MEAC yeah. is too. But again, I think this is just from a theoretical approach. And again, yeah. I will say this. Mm -hmm. We have to look at this. We cannot just be in a position where we're not innovative and in looking at the options. Just because you look at it doesn't mean that it's going to go down because you're going to look right. at the pros right. and what right. we're just discussing right. now, that it is not feasible to really do it for whatever reason, or there is not enough money or there's not enough guarantee that the television money will cover the cost of money lost. Right. Then anybody here will sit up there and says, no, it ultimately right. doesn't make sense. Right. Uh, but to have the dialogue is the important part to say, all right, this and other dialogues in regards to how do we continue to push the conference forward. Right, Dr. Because Man. I think the biggest thing is what, what, what as the as HBCUs, we need to be looking mm -hmm. at our future. We, we, we're not saying that it has to happen, mm -hmm. but we got to have a foresight to look ahead, look down the road to see what's best for all of the HBCUs. In the MEAC yeah. and the SWAC. And because that's how I'm saying. Because and guys, I think yeah. as we, I, I think as our fan base gets mm -hmm. younger, I think they'll be more receptive to that change. I think right yep. now, with our mm -hmm. fan base being, <coughs> excuse me, uh, my age or, you know, somewhere in the middle there, kind of straddling the line there you know, 50 plus, that sort of thing. Uh, uh, it's going to be difficult to get everybody on board to to make that change. But I think as that fan base turns over and continues to get younger, then there may be more of a call for, you know, a lot of the things that, that you guys are talking about. And, you know, Carlos, you know, I graduated from A&T. And, uh, you know, nobody's been through more change conference-wise Pretty much than them, oh, you know. Yeah. Uh, when I played ball there, you know, we were at MEAC school, that sort of thing. You know, MEAC was just pretty much just formally, and uh, you know, so I'm mm. I'm in on the ground floor, you know, of the MEAC. So I had an opportunity to watch it grow and develop, and you know, become to where it is right now. And you know, so I'm a I'm a loyalist in terms of the way things used to be, you know. So I cringed when they went to the uh, Big exactly. South. I cringed again when they went to the CAA, and uh, you know, but I understand the dynamics behind it and the business decisions that are made simply because of my athletic administration background. You know, mm -hmm. so that helped me to understand things a, a little more. And I think as more people delve into that side of things and get to get to know 
and get to find out, you know, the financials and the things that go along with that. I think you'll get people that'll be more receptive to change in terms of whatever direction you know, our schools decide to go in. But until uh, uh, until somebody's helping these D2 schools to look to move up, that sort of thing, I don't see any of these guys moving in the next eight to nine years. That was you my follow-up I mean, question. I didn't want to get you in I, trouble I, I with think, you. I was yeah, going to ask think, about uh, what SIA schools might exactly. be coming Exactly. When you look at it at the end of the day, you know, you can look at the candidates, you know, from Virginia State to Tuskegee to, mm-hmm. you know, the list just goes on and on. You know, the cost of moving from D2 to D1 is prohibitive right there. You know, and if the new conference that these schools are looking to go into is not willing to carry a big chunk of that cost, you know, then you can pretty much forget any D2 moving up, you know, in the in the near future. It's just not worth it to them. You know, well, so you got a lot of things that go into play. Well, let me ask you this. Well, maybe this conversation kind of moved because – I agree when you were saying, you, you know, you're at least thinking about it, having that dialogue and discussion. Also, with, in that discussion or with that discussion, within the discussion, HBCUs from the SIAC, CIAA, SWAC, and the MEAC, could there be a chance one day in the future that they – Say we're gonna have our own championships, you know, and, and, and football and sports. Do we have the mindset, or will we have the mindset? You think to be able to say we'll have our own, especially when everything is changing and, and, and the power fives. You know, you, you you've heard the conversation that a group of them are gonna leave the NCAA and, and form their own. Would we have Dr. Cavill the mindset? To, to 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 look at that and, and say we'll have our own HBCU football playoffs, including the Division II HBCUs. Yeah, I, I think we we will. I think we continue to have a mindset because we play it out, especially when you talk about the fans. They put a lot on there. But don't think these ADs and uh, VPs of athletics are not on their job. They look at a lot of different things. They have great discussions when they come together in these meetings where they put different things on the table. I think the bottom line, uh, especially if you're going to get the votes from the president and his chancellors, the ultimate question in all this is going to be is, is it financially feasible? Mm-hmm. Much like you've seen the celebration bowl with the MEAC for a while as the incarnation, as we know the history to be now, it was 10 years in the making. It wasn't until the money got to a certain threshold that the MEAC chancellors and presidents, to some degree, some of the ADs were saying, okay, we we have to do this. There's enough money on the table that it just makes sense to do this now. Previous that, it wasn't worth it. So if there are corporations that support the fact that there is money on the table that they believe that they can showcase these uh, championships for HBCUs, and I would say outside of the sport of basketball where there's so much D1 money that it's hard to mm-hmm. real, real, really get to the point where you think you're going to get a million and a half to showcase that. But if you can get significant money, half a million to a million dollars to do a baseball championship with all HBCUs, mm-hmm. there's going to be a serious indication that they think about how to get that done because they're not going to want to not leave that money on the table. You just heard we were talking about the money. Uh, the mm-hmm. money drives all this. You put enough money on the table, you'd be surprised what can get done. <laughs> and, and Carlos, and, Carlos, and, I, I would and, say, and I'm at to work on, I'm at to work on Wheeler there because he, he, he you know, I always <laughs> throw stuff on him, and uh, I, I always get pushback. I love it. <laughs> hey, hey, but you know, you and know, I, you I, know would, I would, I would, I would, I would add this. I would add this, Carlos. Football uh, wise, there's two two numbers you need to be aware of, and that's sixty three. And thirty six, you know. I, I, at the I'm end of the down. day, those those numbers aren't going to change. At the end of the day, you know. And while you may have an upset here, there, you know, at at the end of the day, you know, sixty three is going to trump thirty six uh, nine out of ten times. 
Yeah, so, you know, if you're talking about a true football playoff, that sort of thing, you're not really doing the D2 schools a, a service in terms of sticking them out there and expecting them to fight and battle and compete for 60 minutes, you know, with, with, the, with the school that has almost twice as many scholarships as they have, that sort of thing. So, you know, I don't know how you make that playing field even. Yeah, you know, I, I just I just can't see that at all. You know, and so, you know, that would be the biggest drawback, you know, from a from a true football round robin type thing, that sort of thing. I mean, you know, it, it generates uh uh it generates interest and all that sort of thing. And you know, people will be chomping at the bit to see Tuskegee play South Carolina State or whomever. You know, just throwing those two names out there. Yeah, but at the end of the day, that 63 uh, is going to do something to that to that 36. <laughs> can't, can't, the 30, can't the 37 and the 37 go against each other? And then the 60, <laughs> 63 and the 63. But now, Man. Carlos, when it, when it comes to basketball now, mm -hmm. I have been part – I am part of a group or a mm -hmm. study – is trying to come up with a black college national championship in basketball for both men mm -hmm. and women, mm -hmm. okay? And the way this thing would be set up, it would not keep a team from going to the NC2A because, in fact, the tournament would not even start until the Final Four. Now, by that time, if you still got an HBCU in the Final Four, let that team stay in there. Mm -hmm. But it, this group, this group is looking at trying to do a national championship for both men and women to involve NAIA Division II and Division I basketball. And, mm. and, and that proposal is out there. They've already gone to the NC2A to get approval on it. And they're waiting for the money to get right before they present it. They're waiting Coach, for the money to get right before they present it. Did you Coach, Coach Fredaway, Coach did, did my, my did only did thing did is, did let me, let me throw him. this in real quick. Let did me throw this in. Okay, did my, my did only thing. You? Uh, my, only, you. <laughs> my, my only thing is uh, uh, that time frame is already saturated, you know, with the March Madness and all that stuff that goes along with that. Are we really doing our schools uh, a, a disservice in terms of trying to, let's say, bump heads or compete? With that, with that status quo. No, Willa, the, the tournament would be the week of the Final Four. You would start that Monday. In your championship game would be on Friday, and everybody would still be able to. Uh, you would not be competing with the Final Four. Remember, the Final Four is on a Saturday. Saturday, Monday. Mm -hmm. Your tournament would, would conclude that Friday. Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday. The week of. Right, right. It's the week of the Final Four, it's not like at the same time. A... They they introduced the HBCU All Star. They play it on Sunday in between. Right. Mm -hmm. If you're doing it in the city, same okay. city, the, the the fortune they have with the HBCU All Star game is the trucks and cameras are already there. Right. That's and one the, thing. Mm -hmm. Uh huh. And then, but Dr. Kabilda, we uh, we had picked Atlanta for the first site. Atlanta would have been the would be the first site for this mm. national championship. And the time frame, what we would do is allow your conference champions, your automatics to go ahead and play. Go ahead and play in the NC2A. If you are eliminated, you still have a, a chance to play for the national championship. But if you're in the final four, you don't need to be in our in our uh, national championship. <laughs> oh, you know. right. hey, you good. Right. <laughs> you real good. Yeah. <laughs> So no, I'm just I'm just throwing that out there. That's mm -hmm. that discussion has already been there for basketball. I've I've heard about it, and I know it's pretty serious. I know some of the right. commissioners have looked at it and mm -hmm. um, given the general okay if you know if the money is there. So there's right. a lot of support that's galvanizing. So it'll be interesting to see if the NCA will give the uh, support behind it in terms of the rule guidelines, which is going to be a, a challenge in that framework. But uh, again, I think and, and I'll say this. I, I'll say this. You know, uh, Coach Petterway, uh, we better strike while the iron is hot. 
you know. Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, chocolate ice cream. Chocolate ice cream is the flavor of the month right now. <laughs> you know, how, how, how long, how long will we stay fresh? How long right. will we stay relevant? You know, and if we're not able to strike at this thing like yesterday, you know, then the longer these things play out, the the, the more apt we are to be rolled over to the side and folks say, yeah, well, you know, we've done a lot for HBCUs and, you know, we've <laughs> done this, that, and the other. They'll throw that resume back out there at you, you know, as a reason why we cannot take this further step in terms of doing the things that, that we're talking about right now. So, gotcha. you know, we, we need to get at it. Whomever we is, <laughs> we are, we need, we need to get at it. And uh, we, we need to get at it like yesterday. Right. And I don't know that. That's absolutely correct. And you got further um, collusion taking place. I'll say it like that. I know some people don't want to mm. use it. <laughs> <laughs> what was the power five in regards to what's becoming the power four? And some think ultimately going to be the power three with, you know, some of these unnamed schools uh, that are looking to create this. I won't even say super it's mega conferences. Uh, that mm -hmm. model in a lot of ways the NFL. So we're going to see a change in landscape where rules are going to support some of the things that they continue to want to do because they control the NCAA. So that's why I think it's more important for us to get a little onus in regards to how we're going to play in this marketplace uh, that all of us are talking about. Yeah, that, that's an excellent point because at the end of the day, we come back to it. How are we to be relevant and financially strong helping educate our kids we have to be relevant 500 years from now how do we do that i, I think dialogue is great you know we don't agree on everything but just having that dialogue because once again i'm gonna pick at wheeler i think i have a a, a good idea but i'm gonna run it by wheeler because he's gonna be like but let's look at it this way Mm -hmm. And look at Coach Petaway from the uh, coaching perspective. Dr. Cavill from the perspective, from administration point of view, from a professor, a teacher professor. I think it takes all of those, you know, dynamics to come up with a uh, a viable plan. I really do. I certainly certainly agree with that. I think the think these think tanks in a lot of ways really is what this is. Uh, at some point, we'll get to the point where we even put it on paper. Y'all be surprised how much this information I go back and I journal and I turn into a uh, published paper, white paper, if you would, of mm -hmm. trying to see how do we put these things in paper and really look at it based on the two dynamics that are going on in a lot of ways. Um, and even what Charles Edmund brings to the table in terms of understanding the historical factors, fan, uh, fandom, what that looks like. So. I'm fascinated to see, because I keep telling you, I want that Atlanta market. So I know a lot of folks mm -hmm. uh, are concerned. And I throw Clark Atlanta out there all the time. I know Morehouse in terms of financially, they could do it, but it looks like they are fascinating where they are. And I know Wheeler is sitting up there. It's like, hey, don't come over here and messing with the SIC. We got a good thing going on. So, but, you know, it is what it is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but see, Doc, when they start talking about tradition and history, we got to remember now the MEAC is a spinoff of the CIAA. You no, know, everybody yep. thought that thought that when Norfolk State, when Hampton and 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 uh, A and T and all them pulled out of the CIAA, that the CIAA was going to fold. Well, in terms of basketball, they still have the largest HBCU tournament. No, no, not HBC. They have the largest tournament basketball tournament in the nation. They're larger than, than the Power Five tournaments. So history has shown that just because one or two leave, that's not going to be the demise of the conference. So, so it won't be a problem. We solved it right here. We can do a, a vote and bring Clark Atlanta in tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if the listeners and the rest of the presidents are going to talk about it, but we just did it. Yeah, yeah. Hey, look, hey, hey, Doc, now, let's bring Clark and Morehouse in. So that when you make the trip to Atlanta, you still got two games. Let it be said. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> I don't know. I'm going to abstain. No, I'm not going to abstain. But, you know, I, I think about. You see, Wheeler didn't vote. 
Yeah. <laughs> I'm I'm, I'm going to work That's on a smart Will. man. This is a smart man. But I'm going to work on Will. I'm, 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 me and Will are going to have to get into a, a room and we're just going to have to hash it out. But, but with that being said, Dr. Kavir, I remember the, the, the study you were doing. Yes, sir. And, that, and at the time, it you provided information for them to make a decision whether you could move, stay where you're at. Now we're in 2023, you know, CIAA, SIAC, SWAT, MEAC as a conference. What do you think is some of the things that they would have to do? And I hope it's not too broad. To that, that, that keep the conferences, HBCUs moving at least forward, because we see everything around them is it, it, changing. And to say that it, it's not going to affect us it is but how do we navigate through all of this i I come back to to that again i think the number one thing that we have to wrap our minds around is data we have to be able to control our data and really understand the data that provides powerful information why do i say data analytics because of that data analytics is going to tell the story in such a way to me which is the second biggest thing is being able to increase and get larger amounts from our television deals. Uh-huh. Uh, the, that's going to be where you really get the financial numbers to be able to do a lot of the things that you want to do that Wheeler puts on the table, that Coach Petaway puts on the table in, in terms of some of the concerns there in re, is regards to that. Is where are we going to get this increase of cash flow? And the large institutions being able to get that cash flow from more than anywhere else that you hear this from the television revenue. And I'm Mm -hmm. not here to say that we're going to get anything close to what they get. But if we can get significantly more than what we're getting Mm -hmm. now, it can put our programs in a much more stable program. Let me say this. It was quoted on there that the SWAC um, and really the MEAC as well have the largest financial windfall in terms of what our conferences are giving back to the institutions compared to what I call the historically white colleges in terms of those FCS programs. Uh, We provide more in terms of cash going back to our schools at the FCS level. The other schools are able to get their income because they tend to have larger enrollments. And so they're Mm -hmm. able to operate at a higher level in regards to the operational, but it's based on enrollments, not necessarily cash flow. We were talking to some conferences out there when seriously the conversation that I was privy to, I won't get the names in there because I don't want to get anybody, um, you know, to get a call tomorrow in regards to why is this information out. But I know there were certain conferences, historic white conferences, that called several uh, institution HBCUs and talked about them moving over in the southwest region, southeast region, if you would. And one yes. of the questions come is, what are you paying to your member institution? And the response was, is we don't pay anything. We use our money that we get from the NCAA to put in all our tournaments. So there Mm -hmm. isn't distribution at that level for a lot of the conference. And the ones that they do are much smaller in regards to uh, what we have in the SWAC. So we do have to level set and understand that where we are compared to the other FCS in terms of the distribution money is higher than the others. But we have to find a way to grow our enrollment. Uh, with the students uh, to even take it to the next level, increase the television money when these next uh, negotiations come up for these television deals. Well, I can I can be I can bet that the commission of the Southwestern Athletic Conference, when that next contract comes, my humble opinion, because I, I I I see and I hear about the complaints, but I think at the end of the day, he's going to get it done. And it's going to be much more. I agree. Are we going to be with another network? <laughs> now, we, yep, that, there you go. Call competition. <laughs> we got we got about three minutes left. Uh, Will, that laugh, that, that laugh bothers me. Will. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, anyway, 12. I'm, I'm picking that, Will. I like picking that, Will. Uh, we got about four. <laughs> Four, four minutes left. Uh, wrap up. Uh, closing comments. We'll, we'll start with Coach Petaway. We'll go Charles Wheeler and Dr. 
Cavill. Well, I, I just want to think. I think we just need to keep the discussion open, keep our minds open when it comes to talking about the future of HBCUs, and we just got to look at it. And I and I agree with uh, Dr. Cavill. Uh, the numbers, the analytics, the data, that's what's going to drive the decision. Got and I just think all keep, of it. Keep, the com- keep the conversation open. Charles? All I can say is this is a great discussion. We need to keep grinding and keep going. Willard? Well, yes, it sir. has been a great discussion, Carlos. No, no ifs, ands, and buts about that. I am sitting in the parking lot of my high school uh, right now in Baltimore you know, contemplating and, you know, going through some things. Uh, You guys know I'm no longer at Fort Valley State. And so, you know, looking to take that next step, that next challenge, whatever that may be. And, uh, you know, so this has given me an opportunity to kind of think back on some things and kind of get back to my roots a little bit and, you know, kind of reflect, you know, that sort of thing. And so, you know, but this conversation is definitely pertinent, no if ands, or buts about it. And we have to be ever evolving. I mean, we, we got to keep thinking on this thing and, you know, we got to keep throwing out there, see what sticks up against the wall. You know, we got to keep shooting it down and building it back up and, you know, shooting it down again, that sort of thing. And make sure I's and T's are dotted and crossed because it's, it's, it's big. It's big. Our kids are dependent on us. You know, our institutions are dependent on us. You know, these brain trusts that are, that are out there. They need to know, you know, what what people are thinking, that sort of thing. And so we need to be about the business of giving them the ammunition necessary for them to make an informed decision. And that's yeah. what I feel like we're, we're doing, you know, with our conversations, that sort of thing. And Wheeler, it's just another opportunity. I'm waiting to hear where your next <laughs> adventure is as far as athletic administration. Thank you. You're going to get there. Dr. Oh, Bill? Yes, definitely. Certainly. First, let me just say a uh, pleasure to the gentlemen. All of y'all allowing me to join this space because I know y'all have done wonderful work and to be a part of this is uh, self it means a lot in regards to being able to join this intellectual group here in regards to having these meaningful discussions. As everybody said, I think we need to continue to have this dialogue, put this information on the table just so to make sure that our fans and um, obviously some of the administrators uh, watch this as well. They take this information and they use it as think tank uh, things to make sure that they are continuing to move forward. So I'll leave you with this. We need to make sure that we continue to be innovative. We need to be, make sure that we continue to be strategic. Uh, we need to make sure that we hold on to our history and the cultural aspects of what makes what I call a sporting HBCU diaspora what it is today. Yeah, as I see the feedback. A uh, great discussion, and I'm just glad to be a part. I, I, I kind of feel like a, a student in a classroom. I may be a bit overwhelmed a little bit at first, but I stick in there, and then it gets a little bit better. I'm understanding a little bit more. And that's the way I look at it. I um, want to thank uh, Roy for producing today's show, uh, Charles, Coach Petaway, uh, Dr. Cavill, uh, Willa Brown, and everyone um, – in the chat room with the discussion keep it going as always and i always say this a lot of times the solution to a problem is multifaceted and to solve the problem it has to be multifaceted not just one course to determine it but we have bright people and bright minds in this hbcu realm and I just love it. I just love the discussion. And if I can learn from Charles, Coach Petaway, Dr. Cavill, Wheeler, that's right, Wheeler, we're going to have a discussion. <laughs> <laughs> I can learn from them. Hey, I, I love it. And then when you learn something, you share it with others. And that's how it goes. I won't ask you guys for a football prediction, but I will say this. Football season is here. It's going to be exciting. Let the games begin. When the bright lights <laughs> come on, some shine. Some before the game, they don't shine. But when those lights come on, they shine. Until next Saturday at 11 a.m. for another edition. Charles, don't Marlo, so you close it out. 
Pet away. I'll be there for homecoming. After <laughs> I want some of your fried fish. I got you. I got you, Doc. I got you. Honey. I got you. <laughs> All right, there, Carlos. Go ahead. Is it fresh fish that he he caught? Exactly. Yes, yes, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> yeah. I can't fight against that. That's I got you, Doc. Precious. <laughs> also, I want to thank the Blue and Gold Century Club, uh, proud sponsor of the Coles Brown Show. Also, the announcement with JBN. Exclusive content. If you become a member, you'll have privy to that exclusive content. All the shows inside the HBCU Sports Lab, the ONG Strike Zone, all across Black College Sports Rap, all of them. They do a great job. Help support. The off camera uh, stuff is even better than what you see on camera. Oh, well, boy, the off camera stuff was on camera. <laughs> <laughs> the stories we could tell. Now, Charles, until next Saturday at 11 a.m. for another edition of the Carlos Brown Show right here on the Black College Sports Network. Until next time, peace and God bless. <laughs>